One of the big stories of 2016 was the protest over the Dakota Access Pipeline. On this episode of Storing the Public Square, we're joined by two Native American activists to talk about events at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation and the role of storytelling in historic and contemporary Native culture. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selve Regina University, alongside my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. We began this show because we believe storytelling plays a critical and generally underappreciated role in public life. From the stories fashioned by political campaigns to the stories told by novelists, filmmakers, activists, and others, these narratives shape public understanding and the contours of American public life. And so each week we explore these stories with the people who tell them and study them. Joining us this week, Lorenz Spears is a Native American educator, storyteller, and executive director of the Tomaquag Museum in Exeter, Rhode Island, dedicated to the preservation and celebration of Narragansett and other indigenous history and culture. The Tomaquag Museum, we should note, won the 2016 National Medal for Museum and Library Service, presented last summer in an event at the White House. Congratulations. Thank you. Also joining us, Christian Hopkins is a Native American activist and entrepreneur. In 2016, he traveled twice to Standing Rock, including late in the year when he helped build a longhouse for a camp school. Uh, Lauren and, and Christian, thank you so much for being with <laughs> us today. Um, Lauren, I wonder if we could start with you. Could you tell our audience a little bit about what's been happening at Standing Rock? Well, I don't know as though I'm the ex expert on that, but my son is there right now, and he, basically I get virtually no information from him. <laughs> 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 but, you know, the, the folks at the camp are really standing their ground because we don't really know where the political climate is going to go. And even though they've had some victories this fall, um, there's really not a, a really strong assurance that things will stay that way and that they will uphold and honor the, the legal battles that they've won thus far. And so people are sort of standing their ground and just kind of um, keeping things going um, and keeping it in the public eye so that people can know that it's, it's about um, environmental issues, but it's also about um, treaty issues and sacred lands. And that's something that sometimes gets forgotten in in the stories. So uh, just in, in the most basic of terms, we're talking about the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation Correct. Uh, in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is an oil pipeline that a company is trying to build that doesn't actually cut across the, the reservation <laughs> itself, but would threaten the water supply? Well, it actually goes across, from my understanding, a portion of their actual reservation lands and several sacred sites along the way, um, some of which they've identified and actually had a court injunction that was stopping them from uh, the, the um, my brain just went blank on uh, the construction group, um, stop them from actually digging there and they actually went in and dug up some of those sites that were actually proven as sacred sites. And so there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that are beyond the water issue, which is of course a grave issue. Um, as the slogan goes, water is life and if we continue to destroy the water, we're uh, destroying it not just for the folks in North Dakota, but across the, this only one finite planet. And if we continue to do that, it causes major problems. But behind the scenes, there's also a big issue around these sacred sites that are there destroying as well in the process. Um, some that have already been destroyed in this process of the Dakota Access Pipeline and some that they are trying to stop them from continuing to destroy. So, so there's clearly a greater meaning and significance than simply the pipeline and simply the water. And I think we'll get into that in a minute. But Christian, I wanted to turn to you for a second. You traveled twice from the East Coast by car, if I understand it correctly, Yes. to Standing Rock and back. Um, twice last year. That's a round trip distance of 4,000 miles, a long trip to take by car or anyway. What motivated you as a young man living, young native living on the East Coast to go there and join 
all the other people who were there. Sure. Um, so what, what motivated me to go out there was hearing about the, the children that are there at Standing Rock. Um, I was very privileged to uh, attend Nui to One School, which was run by Tom O'Clock Museum, and had the, uh, the experience of being empowered in, 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 in an indigenous uh, community and, and, and in an indigenous environment. And these kids are learning in a similar fashion here at the camp uh, with the uh, sacred water school that's established there. And so that really motivated me to, to want to do something that would help those kids have the same experience that I had. Um, so when I first went out there, I partnered with Tom O'Clock Museum and they supplied me and sponsored me to, to go out there and, um, and donate school supplies for the school. Um, also had a lot of help from the uh, community down in southern Rhode Island as well as um, the uh, Rhode Island Indian Council. A lot more happened there too. There was violence. <clears throat> and if I understand correctly, you were there during one of those nights of of violence when bad things happen against people who were peacefully trying to do good. Yes. What happened? So uh, no, it happened on November 20th um, in the uh, late hours and the early into the 21st. Um, and what was going on was uh, we were there um, right at the roadblock of 1806, uh, Route 1806. And uh, they, there was nothing there when I first arrived um, about three to four days prior. Um, but when we came back to that site, they had razor wire set up, they had um, Jersey barriers uh, going across the street, they had uh, burnt military vehicles in front of that, and then behind that they had the, the uh, line of officers as well as, uh, I guess, a riot vehicle. And um, they began to spray us uh, with water, um, which was uh, Something that you, you don't expect to see uh, in 2016. Um, and they were just spraying people down uh, because of really just the opposition of, of how they felt and, and protecting a, a sacred water source. You know, water is sacred to, to the Narragansett people as well to other nations, and, and this is being demonstrated. Um, and when you, you are met with that kind of opposition, uh, because they are after uh, a profit, not necessarily the law enforcement, but uh, the company that is supporting the law enforcement that, su that is uh, doing the unspeakable acts that, to us. Um, uh, it's, it's really disheartening. Um, they sprayed us to, to keep us away, um, and, and uh, they also started to use tear gas, um, mace, um, rubber bullets, mm -hmm. um, all those things to, to really divide the unity that is there. Um, there are people from all over the world. It's not just an indigenous thing. And that's one thing that we really tried to, to uh, spread is that, you know, it, this is something that encompasses all of us. The, the images of that night, and I think the whole world saw them, were horrifying, for lack of a better word. You had people who were doing good a good cause and then you had I mean it conjured up images you know pick your your time period or your your atrocity or whatever it just it didn't seem like that should have happened at all what what did, what did that say to you both of you a question for both of you is as people who were here long before your peoples were here long before Europeans what did that say to you about the historical injustices against American indigenous people well I think there's an overall just lack of respect and yeah. it, when when I talk to Christian, which, I'm, by the way, I'm so proud of these young people for being out there oh, and, yeah, and, and representing all of us as well that maybe can't go at this moment. But um, our hearts are there and our actions and words are there to help support the, the cause. But I, I think that it just is a long line of disrespect. Um, and if, when you look at the history of treaties and things like that, all along the last several hundred years, you see the lack of respect for our leadership, the lack of respect for our people, and it keeps getting uh, shown again and again and again. It's the 21st century and we're still fighting some of the same issues that we were fighting before. They might look a little different, but it's still about sovereignty. It's still about respect respecting your grave sites and other uh, important religious sites. It's about um, respecting the land and the use of that land that is for everyone. And th that's something that we continue to fight for. And, you know, Christian and the other young people, my own son, which I worry about daily, is out there. He's been out since I think it was 
December 2nd again. He's been there this whole time, stayed there for Christmas. Oh, wow. And I have to give Christian credit. He invited his cousins to go to help build the longhouse uh, for the school. And my son is just so inspired by everything he saw. He turned right around and went back and even spent Christmas there, which you know, on one hand, I was like sad as the mom not to have my son for <laughs> Christmas, he's 20. But on the other side, I was very proud of him for standing up for his convictions and being there and helping in the camp and helping do security and, 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 and just being part of a movement that's really important and to have a voice. You know, I do my part as an educator to give the public comes to the museum and they ask a lot of questions. We keep, we print out a lot of newspaper articles and things so that people can look at them and um, and we share from our own perspective what we know, um, not ever expecting to be the experts. The folks at Standing Rock are the experts, but um, we can share what we know um, to help uh, broaden the understanding. And a lot of people have reached out to us um, that wanted to support Standing Rock or wanted to go out there and they were asking the museum staff questions and asking for references to people like Christian, you know, so that they could know what to do that would be in the best interest if they were going to send things out there or they were going to drive out there, what do they really need? I'm, I'm curious sort of, and I want, I want to hear Christian's answer to Wayne's question, but I'm also curious, Lauren, what you make of the sort of the public's reaction to this story. Uh, you know, the, the, the protests had started, the, the confrontation at the reservation had started long before it really got mainstream media mm -hmm. attention. Uh, and so there were little pockets on Twitter and on social media mm -hmm. where you would learn about this. Mm -hmm. um, but it really did not catch the bigger public's attention until some of the incidences like what Wayne described were the real uptick in violence by the, by the, by the authorities and by the company that's, that's trying to drill there. What do you make of that sort of, uh, I guess, indifference uh, uh, well, prior to the real sort of spectacular Events. Well, I think there's indigenous invisibility in this country. I mean, there are indigenous people that have been here before this was a country and we're very invisible in the mainstream fabric of what is the United States today. So people do come and ask, but most people have no idea. Even today, people will come in and they just don't know. Unless they're very strong in an environmental movement, they don't know anything about what's going on at Standing Rock. They don't even, they haven't even seen the news blurbs. And if they have, they had, very little context to make it make sense. So it's just just a little sound bite that they've forgotten about. Um, so it's not really, it's not a willful prejudice or bigotry or whatever you would call it. It's simply not being informed or not knowing, which I, I guess is where education- It's an institutional uh, racism by erasure. So people don't, the individuals aren't doing it overtly, right. but our whole system has made us invisible. Everything from the way that we teach history in the United States and separate out native culture into weird little pockets of little Native American units of generic Indians to um, the, the spreading of propaganda of that we're all, you know, the last one happened, you know, the last of their people and then we're all gone kind of thing. Um, this this institutional erasure of our people has made it so that these issues that come up in the 21st century, people don't even really, in some cases, I mean, I, I work at a Native American museum and people are shocked that there's still Indians in America. Um, and, and you know, really? really. I mean, you and hear that from people. I really hear that from wow. people. That's not an exaggeration. I really hear that from people. Um, they don't, the way it's represented and the you have college students that sometimes, I've taught a college class a couple years ago at URI, and the students were shocked. We were, it was a literature class, but when you're reading about Native American literature, it's talking about all these social justice issues and the poetry and in the writings, and they were shocked. Some of them had never known. They had never studied it. They were in college. They're honor students. They had no idea. Um, of the things that were going on in the 21st century and the kinds of fights that Native people have to go through um, and the kinds of bias that's out there, in some cases just from lack of knowledge and in some kind, in other cases overt bias. Well, we need to do a quick station identification. This is Story in the Public Square where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvey Regina University alongside G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square can also be heard each weekend on Sirius XM Channel 124, the POTUS Channel. Thank you for listening and watching. Our guests today are two Native American educators and activists, Loren Spears and Christian Hopkins. Christian, I wonder, picking up on, on what Loren was just saying, um, is what's happening at Standing Rock the start of a movement? Um, 
what's happening at Standing Rock has been happening since 2014. Um, the, the actual movement began with the, the tribal youth of the Standing Rock tribe. And they actually ran to uh, Washington, D.C. I know that uh, CNN did a small excerpt on them. And it's, it's very, uh, like um, what Loren was saying, very isolated um, incidents uh, are only recorded uh, for the mainstream media. So you have a lot of people who, who are exposed but then forget what is actually happening. So this has been happening for a long time. Um, and so is, is it the beginning? Um, I think it's, it's an awakening of the, the American mainstream uh, because there is so much uh, social media uh, uh, being uh, shared uh, with the community of you know, the American people, of the general public. Um, they're starting to see um, you know, raw footage of, of what's happening to uh, indigenous peoples, but not only just indigenous peoples, but these are peoples who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are um, EMTs, who are uh, veterans. You know, so um, I think uh, the beginning uh, is to, to look at us as American people first, you know, and realize that we're, we're no different. Um, yes, we have history here, um, but we are also considered American, so we shouldn't be looked at differently. Um, and, uh, and so our voice should be respected, you know, and then kind of that indigenous invisibility um, is, is happening because of that separation of, of you are you and I am me, uh, them and us. Um, and so it really needs to be inclusive, and that's kind of what Standing Rock does. Um, they have people from all over the world who are supporting this one cause. And so, yes, I think that um, it is a start of something that realizes that uh, we are unified and we need to be um, looking at the, the important issues of respecting a culture and their historical sites, but also respecting your, your natural resources. I, I think there's no question that the stories that have come out of Standing Rock, whether they're stories that we're talking about orally here or we're talking about news coverage or we're talking about Facebook photos, whatever the stories were, are important. Storytelling has been a critical part of raising consciousness, the awareness and the awakening that you were talking about. So let me sort of cleverly <laughs> segue here to storytelling in general, mm -hmm. which is what the Tomaquag Museum is all about. It's about more than that too, but talk about Tomaquag because it's really, it's an unusual and it's a unique institution and I, I think we can probably call it that now since you went to the White House and Michelle Obama <laughs> gave you your, your award. So. Just talk a little bit about the museum, where it was, where it is, sure. and where you're going and why it's important. Well, Tomaquag Museum certainly is an important organization in the state of Rhode Island. It's the only Native American museum in Rhode Island solely and run by indigenous people. And so we really, from our very beginning in 1958, we were founded by Eva Butler, who was an anthropologist and researcher, and Princess Redwing, who was a Narragansett educator and activist and artist. Um, that really told the first person stories of our people um, from the very early days along with people like Princess Pine Needles and Tall Oak Whedon. And our museum is very unique because it is a first person story. And so because of that, even to this day, our newest educator interns, they're learning how to tell the history, the culture, but through their story lens. Because it's not about coming in and re regurgitating information that's just factual history. It's about how does that history connect to you as the educator? Because that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the story. So I believe storytelling is extremely important. There's the classic storytelling, meaning that you're telling a historical legend or, or that kind of thing. But there's also just telling your stories through your lens, the history, the culture, the arts um, from your perspective. So every time you come to the museum, literally you're getting a different story because depending on who the educator is and what questions you ask and what exhibits you're looking at, you get a whole different view. So one of the things that we're doing this year is we're coming up with some new themes to represent. So the, the very first one is uh, civil rights and social justice. So That's it's sort of theme. looking at that lens of the, the 50s and, or 60s and 70s in the, the civil rights era, if you will, um, 
what that looks like as far as the American Indian movement and, and how that intersects with the overall civil rights movement in the United States and how does that transcend to today when we look at things from, we feel like a certain amount of civil rights have been granted, but now it's the social justice of um, empowering the people and, and really truly upholding to the law of what is civil rights. And you know, in, in simple things like this year, Tomaquag Museum, um, we have a new initiative called the Indigenous Empowerment Network, um, where it's all about empowering youth in particular, but our tribal community as a whole in Rhode Island. Um, through this partnership with Third Sector New England and now the USDA, we're funded to help create jobs and job training and education and empowering people through their own culture um, as well. And so there's so many different facets of what the museum does. There's the public education, and but in order for you to have that public education from a first person story, you need to empower the indigenous people to learn how to tell what's already in their head. Christian and any other young person out there or, or older, the, the stories of their life is already inside of them, but how do you scaffold that out? How do you train them to be able to tell their stories um, in a way that's appropriate for the public and appropriate for each age group that comes in? Um, and also in a way that doesn't give away too much of who they are, because there's always some things that are for yourself and your own community. Help me understand something. So both of you on multiple uh, 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 multiple questions have talked about how important the youth and the next generation is. Why is that so important? Uh, well, because they carry on our, our, uh, our culture. Um, and that is, is very important because that is our identity. And so you want to instill that, um, that pride in, in themselves. Uh, because if someone's not grounded, it's easy to sway um, and, and, and lose focus of what's important. And so um, our culture keeps us grounded and it reminds us of our ancestors and, and their unique uh, mindset you know, that's brought to us. And, and you know, we embrace that and we have stories and we have um, you know, our family structure. Um, everything is unique and that makes all of us unique. Um, each tribe is, is, is different, you know, that we're, we're not all the same. Um, and so, you know, when you have youth who embrace that, um, you, you get to see the, the, the morphing of a culture um, and how it adapts uh, to, to the new ages and to, um, you know, just to see how, you know, your, your youth really um, carry it. You and know, it's really is, amazing is, to see. Is part of that, though, the, 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 the passing of traditions, the passing of the, the knowledge and the memory and the identity? from generation to generation? Most definitely, and, and, and you know, I'm, a, I'm like the proud mama over here. <laughs> so I was one of my first, yeah, first graduates like from, mothers, yeah. from, from New Mutual School. But um, uh, the thing that I always have been taught to me and that what I've always taught to the youth that I've worked with and my own children is that it's our responsibility today to impact the next seven generations to come. And it's a phrase that's used a lot, but I like to look at it this way. You know, my grandmother, uh, Eleanor next Dove, seven generations? is next seven generations. Yeah. She's 98 years old. So she's got her children, her grandchildren, her great grandchildren, and her great great grandchildren that are living today. But most people can't get to that fifth generation sometimes, but not very often. Yeah. And, and, and But then six and seven, when you're thinking about what you're doing today and how that's supposed to impact that seventh generation, it's, it's, it's an awesome experience, like in a, in a, in a like awe-filled way, you know, because it's like you really have to think about what you're doing and how you're impacting that. So when Christian is doing these things or I'm doing what I'm doing at Tomaquag and everyone's working at Sitting Rack, it's not about what's happening today. It's about what are we doing seven generations out? Are we going to have fresh water to drink? Are those sacred sites going to be honored and respected? Are people going to be respectful of each other? Are, are we going to have an earth to live on? You know, these are not little topics and they're not just today. They're, 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 what we're doing right now, you know, what is it, the drop in the pe pebble yeah. in the pond and it reverberates out? Well, this is what's happening here. This is reverberating out. And, and, and these are not just Native American issues. These are global issues. Yeah. These are and humanity they, issues. And so that's a philosophy that applies to everyone on this planet or should apply. You know, we live in a very, you know, social media oriented, short attention span society, boom, boom, 24 seven news cycle here, gone, bah. Your philosophy, as your people have long held, is to look 
seven generations. Mm -hmm. To think about what you do today, how it will impact not just tomorrow, but many years in the future. Correct. Yeah. Did and I that's summarize why you that can't correctly? Just think about the money right. today, because the money today might not save us later. You know, we have to we have to have fresh drinking water, we have to have clean air, we have to have a place to live. Do you, do you feel a sense of urgency about all these issues? Because I think there is a sense of urgency. Yes, yes. I think uh, it, there needs to be a sense of urgency because if you don't take initiative now, uh, who's going to carry that? And are you going to teach that to the next generation? Because if you don't, how are they going to know better to, to take up that and have that stance? And that's why it's important to transcend your culture uh, because, um, you know, these youth are the ones that started this mo um, movement, really, um, to, to protect the water. And it was the, the tribal community that backed them. Do, do you have a sense of optimism or hope? You're a, a young person. You're relatively new on the planet. What, <laughs> you know, I'm, but I mean, you are. And so I'm, I'm trying to tap sort of your emotional pulse here. What, what do you feel when, you know, having done what you're doing, looking at the world, understanding what's happening on the, the larger picture, the smaller picture? What, are you hopeful, optimistic, pessimistic? Where well, are you? Um, you know, you have to be optimistic. You can't not be. You can't afford not to be. Um, and uh, I think uh, our people, you know, people in my generation are very resourceful. Um, you know, we, we come up with different things. We have new apps that we develop. We have um, uh, movements that we start. Um, and so uh, I do have hope. I think that a lot of the uh, addresses that are being addressed today are because of the, the younger generation. And it's, it's challenging the status quo and it's changing the institutional norm. And so uh, it can be a more inclusive uh, environment and country for, for all of us. Good. We need that. Is there a link, and we've got about a minute left here, but is there a link between um, the environmental issues, like what we've seen exposed at Standing Rock, and issues of racial justice? I think so, because I think environmental justice and racial justice are inter interwoven and if you think about it in an in a, in a inner city environment for example or even in a rural they often put things that are negative to the environment in those rural places um, whether that's you know uranium on another reservation whether it's lead in certain areas um, toxic plants they, they always seem to be in I'll, I'll call it places of poverty it might not always be ethnicity but tends to be more statistically higher in those areas. So those things are interwoven. You know, nobody wants it in their backyard, so put it in the people that can't fight against it because they don't have any resources yeah. to put in the poverty environments. And, and so. to support Unfortunately, that. we gotta leave it there. We're out of time, yeah. but uh, that's a, it's a remarkable conversation. If you yeah. enjoyed the show, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or visit us at PellCenter.org, and be sure to join us next week for another episode of Story in the Public Square. For Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis. Thanks for joining us.